Jim Callis joining us from MLB.com and MLBpipeline.com. And Jim, with eight on your new top 100 list, uh, that is pretty exciting for the Baltimore Orioles. You've never seen it in your lifetime. I've never seen it in my lifetime. What? Where is the organization right now with such a strong prospect list? Yeah, I mean, obviously they've been going through a rebuilding process for a while, but the Orioles have the best farm system in baseball. I think it's pretty remarkable you have eight guys on the top 100 and we realize they graduate Adley Rutschman. Like, you know, I mean, if if Adley was still part of this list, you'd be talking about nine, which I would believe would tie the most ever on a list since I've been at MLB.com, the most that were ever on a list when I was at Baseball America. Um, pretty amazing that you have you know, Adley Rutschman, who's been the number one prospect at times, is now number one on the Orioles list is Gunnar Henderson, who's the best prospect in baseball. And Jackson Holliday is my pick to be the number one prospect in baseball by the end of the year. So it's not just that they have a lot of guys on the top 100, Steve. It's that they have difference making superstars on the top 100. And I just rattled off three guys. Clint Adley's not on the list anymore. I didn't even mention Grayson Rodriguez who's right there in the discussion for best pitching prospect in baseball too. So it's not just, Hey, we've got depth. The system's deeper than it has been in years. They have, you know, guys who are going to be superstar. I mean, it's pretty exciting to think about probably a couple years away, but like three, four, five in the batting order is probably going to be some combination of, of Rutschman, Henderson and Jackson holiday, unless they're batting them higher in the order. And then you have Grayson Rodriguez, you know, who's got Cy Young award capability, you're going to be joining the rotation at some point this year, you know, and all the other guys, all the other young players they have. It's really, really exciting. I guess now as, as analysts such as yourself and people around baseball, look at the Orioles player development, is it a, a combination of player acquisition? Obviously they they've done well with the draft under Mike Elias and then player development, Matt blood and his staff and the managers or, you know, and, and their technology and all this has sort of come together right now. Yeah, that's that's exactly right, Steve. I mean, it, it, it's it's very rare that you're going to have like a a, you know, elite level farm system without clicking on all cylinders. I mean, you can have the best drafters in the world, but you need to develop the players and you could have the best developers in the world, but they need talent to work with. And, you know, you, you mentioned the technology, you know, the, you know, the development. It's so exciting, you know, just the, the technology and the methods in which players are getting better it keeps changing. And I'd say in the last five years, maybe more of it the last 10, but really in the last five years, it's really changed the notion. I mean, I used to think, and I think a lot of people used to think that, yeah, you might be able to help a player address a weakness or make them a little better, but a player kind of, you know, had some limits as to how good you could make him. You know, it wasn't like you were going to make a guy a lot better, but now I think, you know, especially with all the, you know, technology, especially on the pitching side, but even on the hitting side too, you know, and, and just athletically, you know, it's not like we're building, I'm thinking the $6 million man from when we were kids, Steve, where we're, you know, the technology, we will build him. But like you, you players are getting quicker, stronger, spinning the ball faster, throwing harder. You're seeing your know, college guys and you used to feel like college pitchers in general, we're f- a lot of cases for the most part fully developed and, and guys are coming and making huge leaps like in, in their first couple seasons of pro ball. So yeah, they're, they're hitting on all cylinders. Mike's done. A, I mean, Mike's doing what he was brought in to do. Matt blood's done a wonderful job as farm director. I think Brad Siolik who, who heads up a lot of scouting efforts. They've obviously made some very good number one overall picks, but also some picks lower in the draft. And uh, it, it's exciting. Um, it, it's exciting to see. Not just eight, but three of the top, 12 and i mean three potential studs as we know with gunner and grayson rodriguez and jackson holiday did jackson holiday's year really help elevate this list i mean his tools were loud and they were heard throughout baseball it sounds like yeah i mean i mean you know when you have the number one overall pick you're gonna get a pretty good player but i think I don't want to be Mr. Hyperbole. I guess I am Mr. Hyperbole. Jackson Holiday might go down as one of the better number one overall picks all the time. You know, like we talked about this with Adley Rutschman, how, you know, Adley Rutschman to me, you know, I, I'm getting old, Steve. I've been doing this since 1988. Adley Rutschman's the best catching prospect to come out of the draft since I've been covering this stuff. 
And that's you know, pretty good timing to be picking number one in, in, in 2019 and, and get Adley Rutschman. And with Jackson Holiday, you know, I'm not saying he's going to be A-Rod because A-Rod's the best shortstop prospect I've ever seen come out of the draft. But you're talking about a guy who can do it all and got better in every aspect of the game last year. He got, you know, in high school, you know, coming into the year, I, I think the consensus was he was a second round pick, Steve. Like, you know, maybe he was first rounder, late first rounder for some teams. But, you know, he had kind of a, you know, like some guys do on the showcase circuit. He was hunting home runs and there's some swing and miss. And guys liked him, but he was like, okay, he was in this cluster of middle infielders who weren't going to go at the top of the draft. And I'd say, I don't know. I don't know if it was like two weeks into a season. I just kept hearing anybody who wants to see him was like, oh my God, Jackson Holiday, he could go at the top of the draft. And, you know, this has not happened very often, but, you know, we put grades on players at MLB.com, you know, in conjunction with talking to scouts. And Jackson Holiday is one of the few draft players I can remember who got better in literally every category. Better hitter, he set the national high school record for hits in high school season, forever. that's just a better hitter, more power, faster, the arm was stronger, he looked smoother at shortstop, and he's already good. I mean, he was already a good player to begin with. And then, top it off, I don't put a lot of stock in, in, in stats and pro debuts because, you know, they're – usually the players had a layoff, it's a small sample size, you know, he might be play, facing players, high school versus college, either – much older than him or much younger than him. So you can't read too much into the stats. Like Derek Jeter didn't have a great debut. Chipper Jones didn't have a great debut, on and on and on. But Jackson Holiday came into pro ball and controlled the strike zone like he was, you know, like a five-year pro. Um, and and that's really the thing I look at the most for hitters or pitchers in their debut. If, if I was going to look at one stat, it's how well do they control the strike zone. And even when he got to A ball, uh, you know, as a teenager, he controlled it. So I, I just – I know I'm gushing about him here, Steve. <laughs> I think he's going to be the best prospect in baseball by the end of the season. We're going to have a bunch of guys at the top of our list are going to graduate. And I think this guy is going to be special. And it's interesting. <sighs> like, I like Gunner a lot coming out of high school. Obviously, he didn't have that kind of hype because he wasn't the number one pick. You know, pretty amazing that the Orioles got two guys who ranked as the top prospect in baseball in the same draft, and Allie Rutschman and Gunnar Henderson. And Gunner's great. I mean, he's best prospect in baseball. If you made me pick right now, long term, who's going to be a better player? I take Jackson Holiday. I'd I, I roll the dice. Like, there's a little more risk there because he he doesn't have the body of work, and I think Gunner's going to be great too. But th- I'm just telling you, Jackson. I mean, man, it, it's crazy. Like, like they're going to have the Orioles are probably going to have three players who are the number one prospect on our list at some point in Rutschman, Henderson, and Holiday, and that's unheard of. I can't think of a parallel for that. Like, especially that short a time period. Yes. Two other quick things, Jim, and thank you as always for your time. And there's probably no stats kept on this, but Gunnar Henderson getting to number one was the number 42 draft pick in 2019. The Orioles' second pick, but overall number 42. Uh, And again, I'm sure this list at the top is populated often by guys taking one, three, five, 10, 12. 42, I think, is probably pretty good to move to number one in the rankings. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking here. I'm just looking. I have – obviously, I've worked at Baseball American. I've worked at MLB.com. I, I just popped up the MLB list, MLB.com list, which began in 2004 while I was still at BA. And looking at the guys on there, Joe Maurer was number one overall pick. Delman Young was number one overall pick. Jay Bruce was uh, – I think he went 12th, I want to say, to the Reds. David Price was number one overall. Jason Hayward went 14th. Mike Trout was a pretty good one. He went 25th. Matt, well, Matt Moore was an eighth rounder. And Matt Moore was number one on the list. Profar's international guy. Buxton was number two. Seeger was around 20. Bregman was two. Benintendi was seven. Mancata, Otani, Guerrero, Franco, all international. Rutschman, one. Witt, two. Alvarez, Francisco Alvarez was international and then Gunner. But yeah, so Gunner, at least on MLB.com's list, would be the second lowest um, player. I don't think we had Matt Moore at BA. I think we had Harper or Trout. That was a pretty interesting top three argument back then. So yeah, no, it is. I mean, now to be fair, I think Gunner was kind of a late consensus, late first round talent. And I think because the Orioles had the big bonus pool in 2019, picking one. 
they maybe pushed Gunner down a little bit. But yeah, it, it is. I mean, it's amazing just rattling off all those guys. Most of those guys were top 10 picks. Yes. Um, and, you know, Gunner's just gotten better too. Um, you know, Gunner, there was a lot to like about Gunner. I mean, there was hitting ability. It was a big athletic frame. Um, I think he was like a small school, like basketball player of the year in Alabama. Um, you know, maybe private school basketball player of the year. He moved well. Um, you know, I think there's some question, like, like there always is, he's big, is he going to outgrow a shortstop? But if he does, he's going to be a really good third baseman. Um, so there was a lot to like. Um, but you're right. I mean, obviously, if anybody projected this guy's going to be the top prospect in baseball four years later, he wouldn't have been there for the yes. Royals of 42. And I think they've done, I mean, the other thing you have to give him credit for is he lost a year of development, like with the pandemic. I can't remember if he was at the alternate site, but like, the alternate site was not like getting a full year of minor league development. So he gets drafted and his development kind of gets put on hold for a full year right away. Um, and I think the thing that was really impressive about him last year in particular was, you know, again, I was talking about controlling the strike zone for hitters or pitchers. And he did, he had a really nice beginning start to his year in 2021. And then when he got to double a, you know, the strike zone got away from him a little bit. I mean, he was young. So I don't think anybody was like, oh, gosh, you know, he's not going to hit. But it was like, okay, like he really needs to address that. And then he came out last year. At the start of the year, it was like, this guy's like showing patience. He's not swinging and missing. You know, he closed up some holes in his swing, closed up some holes in his approach. Um, So his development, like he almost deserves extra credit because he's, he's gone from the draft to where he is today in really just two seasons. It's not three. It's really just two seasons. And – you know, again, credit to him, credit to Orioles scouts for projecting what he could become and credit to Orioles development for helping him get there. He's, and, and again, it's, it's, I, I was so conflicted before Steve, when, when I was saying I would take Jackson holiday over Gunnar Henderson long-term because Gunnar Henderson is really, really, really good. <laughs> Exciting times in Birdland, Jim. And I know a lot of people will be excited saying curse that's name back on this list you talk about missing time i think it was 27 months or something between games for this kid minor league games that's remarkable um he's well liked as you know he's obviously a talent you saw him in the fall league um did the fall league performance get him back on this list it, it did and, and you know it's funny because i'll be the first to tell you you can't read too much it, well i would say you can't read too much in the fall league stats it's a hitter's league the ball flies a lot of those parks Calvert pitching is not as good as Calvert hitting. Um, so it's not just, oh, you know, he, he put up big numbers in the AFL, so we put him on the list. It was just the way he did it. Like, I saw his first game of the year. He crushed a home run. I don't know if you've ever been to Scottsdale Stadium, Steve, or out for the Fall League. Not. They have, like, a little kind of party deck out there in right field, and he crushed the ball over the party deck. It was just hitting the ball hard all season. Um, you know, I know it was a short sample size, but just talking to scouts, there were some scouts who thought he was as good as any player in the league. And there were some very talented players there. And, you know, it was, it was hard to know what to make of his debut. You know, like, I think if I remember correctly, they sent him to low a, you know, hadn't played in forever because of myocarditis and they had a hamstring pulled this year and he tore up high a, and then he struggled some in, in, I mean, sorry, he, he tore up low a, and I think he struggled some in high a, and then he went to the folly. And I'd say, you almost can't read too much of his performance because it's too. I mean, I know he'd been in instruction league and he'd been to spring training and done some stuff, but it, but you know, just getting back, you, he hadn't played in games in over two years, which and and really, I mean, honestly, more than that, right? Because he was drafted in 2020, so like he didn't even yep. get a full college season that year or a pro debut. Like he played in March of 2020, and then I don't know when he played exactly in, in 2022, but I mean, that's a long time between games. So, like. I didn't really read anything to his performance this year. I mean, I wouldn't have said, had the season ended, he not gone to the fall league, we wouldn't have said, hey, we need to put him back on the top 100. But I, I wasn't killing him either. You know, I wasn't saying like, oh, geez, like high A. Like, it's just like he's rusty. But, you know, it's going to be power over hit, but it's enough hit. Um, I think it's 30-plus home run power. Um, he can get the job done on outfield corner. Um, you probably, I'm sure you probably talked to him at some point during the year, Steve. Great mm -hmm. kid. Yes. Um, you know, and it's funny, like, I, I'll tell you what really impressed me about him, besides the performance. Not to, I mean, you know, sometimes makeup, you, people can read too much and like, oh, like, we're, we're armchair psychologists or trying to delve into what makes a guy tick. But makeup does matter. Makeup does matter. And it was interesting to me, 
I asked him that after that first, I talked to him a few times in the, in the fall league. And I asked him after that first home run, just, you know, about the whole thing, getting back to playing again and, and how special that was. And did he feel any pressure? Cause as we both know, <laughs> when the Orioles took him at two Orioles fans are kind of like, what just happened here? What are we doing? And, you know, nobody expected him to go to, uh, you know, I, I explained how, you know, he was a legitimate top 10 pick. That was a move made to shift money around the draft. And then the guy they were targeting didn't really get to him, and, and they had to scramble a little bit. And then, you know, as we both know, Orioles fans were kind of like, what's this pick? Why, why didn't we take Austin Martin? And, and Austin Martin hasn't worked out real great either. Anyway, I asked him about the pressure that comes with being the number two pick. And, had, you know, I, I was like, he, he's heard the noise. He, he, he knows that Orioles fans were kind of like, what are we doing here? Like, at, at two, um, taking this Heston Kerstad guy. And it was interesting. I, I just asked him about, you know, if there was pre- if he felt pressure from that, is there was added pressure, just not only was he number two pick, but he was kind of questioning being number two pick. And he said he didn't feel any of that because nobody wants him to be better than him. Like, like all his pressure comes from his desire to be the best player he can be. You know, so it, it, I just thought it was interesting. Like he's he's blocked out the noise, but he he, you know, and you talk to Orioles, I'm sure you've heard the same thing. He works very hard, you know, he's worked very hard to not have his skills atrophy with two years and not playing games and just, I'm not even doing his quote yet, but just the way he said it, it was just like that stuff doesn't bother him because nobody wants him to be greater. And nobody expects more out of him than him. And I was like, I like that. <laughs> so yes. um, yeah, no, I mean the, the fall, he definitely put him on the map. And like I said, I mean, Jordan Walker, who in my mind is, is got as much power as anybody in the minor leagues was there. You had Jordan Lawler, you had Jackson Merrill from, from Maryland, great young shortstop in the Padres system. There are a lot of really good players in the fall league. Zach Veen, I go on and on. And, and and there were scouts who said, you know, Kerstad's right there as good as, as any of them. So, yeah, it, it did open eyes. And just from a human interest story, just what he had to go through, very happy for him. Um, and, and the Orioles have to be thrilled, too, because it's like he's – he looks like – I saw him playing college in Arkansas. He, he looks like the guy I saw in Arkansas. You know, same profile. It's going to be a right fielder with big power – and he's not going to be a huge batting average guy, but he'll, you know, he'll be like, he could be like a 250, 260, maybe 30 home run guy, which is what I think you were hoping you were getting when you drafted him at, at two. And like, you know, man, that lineup's going to be interesting, Steve, we're trying to jam all these guys in the lineup. I, I guess we're going to have to bat. Maybe we bat holiday <laughs> second, Rutschman third, Henderson fourth, Kerstad fifth. I don't know. It's, it's going to be interesting. Yes. It's, it's loaded. It's nice to be able to say it and be legitimately right. And fans have asked me, when have I ever covered an Oriole farm this good? The answer is never. Obviously, it's never been this good. So exciting, it might, you, you, honestly, you might have to go back to the 70s when they had Don Baylor and Bobby, Bobby Grish. Yep. And, you know, I guess Al Bumbery. I'm, I'm thinking all these. Or, you know, as you know, I grew up in Northern Virginia and we didn't have a yes. team in D.C. I was watching Channel 2. You And you had, I mean, I guess they traded for Scott McGregor. But you might land again, storm day. Like, like it was probably the 70s is the last time it was as strong. And and to be honest, I think there were some handicaps in the early year, you know, earlier years of the Angeles ownership. They weren't signing international players. They were very tough on fiscals in the draft. I think they've gotten very creative about using their money um in the draft. Look, and it look, it obviously helps. When you're picking one in the year when Adley Rutchman's there. And you're picking one, and Jackson Holiday or Drew Jones would have been a great pick. Is there? That helps. But Grayson Rodriguez was not a consensus. I think he went what eleventh, Steve. Eleven. I mean, high school right handers. Everybody tells you how risky they are. He was not a consensus. Like I, I'm not gonna say they overdrafted him, but I don't think there were a lot of teams that would have taken Grayson Rodriguez at eleven. You mentioned Gunnar Henderson, forty-two. You know, we had him at, like you know, ranked in the twenties on our draft top. 200 or whatever we did at the time. And so I think there was some first round talent, but you know, the Orioles were the team that figured out a way to get him to 42 and they're the team that took him and polished him up. And, you know, and, and we, we haven't even talked about, you know, guys like, you know, Joey Ortiz was not a super high draft pick and he was kind of a defensive guy and his bats made a leap. And, you know, guys like, you know, Kyle Stowers, who's, who's already been stars has already been in the big leagues. Um, you know, they have guys who weren't first round picks too, but like they're, they're really clicking on all cylinders right now. They are fun to talk about 
And there's no one better to talk about it than you, Jim Cowan. So thank you so much for taking time today. And uh, we'll be chatting again real soon, I'm sure. Yeah, sounds good, Steve. Thanks.